Hello everyone and welcome to the continuation of nonlinear analysis in the finite element method and in today's video we are going to be talking about yet another example where we are going to try to analyze it analytically to understand the nonlinearity in it and to get a better appreciation of how nonlinear analysis is a rather different thing than linear analysis and in case you're wondering this is part of a multi part series which is going to be linked to the top right so if you are new to this channel and you want to understand how we got here, you should check out that playlist linked on the top right. Now today we are going to be talking about a nonlinear boundary condition in which it becomes active after some movement. Now this is going to be a rather shorter video and it's going to be the last video of our analytical solutions because in the next video we're going to be starting to formulate our finite element method equations. So without further ado, let's dive into it. So sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Alright, so the example that we have here is example 6.2 from the book Finite Element Procedure by K.G. Bata. This is a well-known finite element book which dives into the depths of the entire method and we are talking about chapter 6, nonlinear analysis. Now here we have a pretension cable. A pretension cable means a cable that is under forces, under tensile forces. Uh, you can see the values here. The cable has a length of 200 centimeters split into two pieces each one of them is 100 centimeters each. The tension in the cable is 100 newtons and the cable is suspended above a gap. The cable is just suspended in mid-air. There is a gap basically and there is a spring here. So of course if there is no force here then the cable is perfectly suspended in mid-air and there is no problem at all. However, because we are pushing with the force down, the cable will basically buckle under the load. Not buckle, the cable will basically displace under the load down. It's kind of like if you have a rubber band and you push the rubber band down. Here is the source of nonlinearity. Because look, if the cable doesn't touch the spring, then there is one behavior. And if the cable touches the spring, then there is another behavior. The gap is one centimeter. The stiffness is two newton centimeter. Now those values are nice and dandy, but I will be focusing on solving this example without values, meaning that I will focus on the derivation of equations because you can use the values to basically plot the response. Now, before we start, let's take a look on some major simplifications being done in this problem to kind of appreciate how deep you can go the rabbit hole if you want to do that. So let's take a look. He assumes that the displacements are so small that the force in the cable remains constant. Now this, if you are a BSc level student, should be okay. But if you are an MSc student or PhD student, this immediately should light up red um, flags in your mind. Because the force in the cable shall not remain constant. The force of the cable changes and you, you can actually do that in this example and I will mention where if this assumption is not assumed then the force inside the cable shall be the pretension pretension forces I think he calls it H here you can see the H here and then you have to add to it anything that results from the deflection or displacement itself meaning you would have to know exactly how much the strain in the element is because, I mean, it's going to move down, so of course it's going to extend a little bit. And if you know the strain, then of course you can know the stress by multiplying by the elastic modulus. And then you can multiply by the length of the element, which is 100 centimeters, to find the extra load. And this leads to yet another rabbit hole. Because who told you that the strain is going to be linear? Maybe the strain is nonlinear. And if the strain is nonlinear, then we go back to example number one. And you should double check the video, which I'll be linking on the top right. Now notice how deep you can go. But of course here, we want to stick with the example. Keep in mind that this is a deeper layer. This is MSc level. And if you want to go PhD level or higher, you would have to double check uh, example one and merge with this example the ability of the cable itself to go nonlinear. So you can see how deep we can go with this. However, here it tells you the cable remains constant and this is a very nice simplification, which might not be the case, but I think it is on the conservative side. Why is it on the conservative side? It is on the conservative side because 
if the cable's force doesn't increase, then the stiffness of the system is lower than what it actually is. Because we know that the force in the cable should increase because you are basically extending its length. And if the force of the cable increases, this means that the resistance forces to the force moving down increase, which increases the stiffness. So this is an assumption that is actually on the safe side because it leads to a leaner, or let, let me say, a less stiff system. The other thing is that the load is applied slowly. Now, if you look here, I don't see a slow load application. I can see a one-to-one -one load application, which is, I don't know, I even you can look here. But okay, fine. He wants you to apply the load slowly. Why does he tell you to apply the load slowly? Because he doesn't want to touch structural dynamics. And trust me, if you want to go nonlinear structural dynamics, that's something that you would research in your PhD. So you can go there. Maybe I should throw in a structural dynamics video series after I finish my nonlinear video series. My PhD was in structural dynamics, so this is a place which is very close to my heart. Anyway, what does he want from you? He wants you to calculate the displacements under the load as a function of the load intensity, meaning that he tells you that I am going to increase the load here and you are going to, ex to calculate the um, displacement. Fantastic. So let's dive into it. Now let me, um, let me try to explain this one by one. First of all, that's the system we have and we have some starting assumptions. First of all, the inertia forces are neglected. The MA is neglected. neglected. The second thing is that a small displacement is assumed. Now, I'm not really sure if that assumption is very valid. I mean, one centimeter to 100 seems not that small. But of course here, this is just an opinion because in the end, it's a subjective and not an objective opinion. But of course here, I want to stick with the same assumption as with Professor Bate, who used the assumption in his example. Now, of course, dear hypothetical viewer, I know what you're going to ask about. You're going to ask about what happens if the displacement is large. Well, then the following happens. is something that will change here, and I will talk about this in a moment. So, dear hypothetical viewer, if you have, la if you have large displacements, then one of the things that I can think immediately of is the sine theta, which I will be talking in a moment. So let's wait for the answer to that. And let's stick with small displacements for now, and we'll tell you what happens if the displacement gets larger. If the response behavior number one, if the cable did not touch the spring, meaning the force here is not enough to buckle the cable or to deflect the cable in such a way to touch the spring, there is still a gap, meaning displacement down at time t is less than the one centimeter gap. This means also that the spring is no longer active, and in that case, in our static equilibrium, we can just dive into summation forces y equals zero, which means that those two forces, because they go up, are positive, and this force goes down, which is negative, or I can just throw it on the other side of the equal sign, meaning that I have 2h sine theta equals r at time t. Now, what is sine theta? Sine theta is basically this theta, which is also equal to this theta. Now, this is the thing. What is sine theta? Now, this length here is the amount of deflection that happened under the load. And this is called TW. However, what is the length of this thing? Now, the length of this line is taken to be the 100 centimeters L. This 100 centimeter became this inclined line. So sine is now TW over L, which is basically the rewriting of this. Now, this will light all kinds of red flags in your mind. I'm pretty sure you're thinking about a lot of things right now. The first thing that I think about immediately is to say, okay, wait a minute, I call foul, because this thing is 100, right? Because the horizontal distance, as you can see, is 100 centimeters. So how are you, Dr. C.E. and also Professor Bata, because I'm taking this idea from his book, how are you assuming that the inclined line is 100? Because obviously you are using this here. So how are you doing that? Why are you doing that? We are doing this because we are assuming that the displacements are actually very, very small. And in that case, we can say that the length of this calf cable before deflection is almost the same as the length of the deflection. And this still will not make sense to you because you would think, well, if this and this are equal, then there is no triangle. It just collapses. And you are right. And this is the ugliness of nonlinear analysis. Sometimes we have to do some ridiculously illogical assumptions just to make our lives somehow easy. The assumption of small displacements 
makes a very strange hypothetical uh, that you have a triangle which is horizontal is the same as its incline, which is, of course, impossible. But that is what it is. Now, let me remind you of some laws, you know, from mathematics to show you how ridiculous this is. You see, when theta is small, we know that sine theta should, in radians, should equal to theta. And the crazy thing is that cosine theta should equal to 1. This is if theta in radians is small. Now, what happens if I say tan theta? Now, the crazy thing in small angles is that tan theta, which equals sine over cosine, and if the cosine is 1, then tan equals sine equals theta. So this is something you might remember from mathematics, and it comes into play here yet again, because tan of this theta is actually the horizontal, the vertical movement divided by 100, which is almost equal to sine theta, which is the vertical divided by the incline, which is still almost 100. This happened because they have small displacements. Now, what happens if we have large displacements? This is something I will explain later, but let me tell you right now as a spoiler, absolute pandemonium. There is a lot of new things you have to do. Uh, allow me to show you what I mean by this. You are trying to find TW. TW is unknown for you. Okay, you have the force R and you're trying to find TW because your end product is going to be a is going to be a graph where you have TW and you have R. So I'm saying that you might have an input as TW and get the output as R, or you might or you might have an input of R and get an output of TW. So what happens if the displacement is large? If the displacement is large, then I can no longer say that this is 100 and that's 100. This is 100 and that's true. This is not 100. This is no longer 100. That's incorrect. And that's TW. Or I mean W at time T. It's not called TW. It's called superscript TW. Now, since this is no longer 100, how can I find sine theta? Well, I have to find this using Pythagoras. And Pythagoras states that it's square root 100 square plus TW square. It's not TW, I keep saying TW. I mean the, way, the W at time T. Now this here becomes hard to implement there. Now you have 2H and this becomes W at time T divided by the square root here, which becomes a harder equation to solve in terms of R. That's the equation you would get. Pardon my handwriting because I'm writing using the mouse. Your response at time T, you force, is going to equal the two horizontal two times horizontal force multiplied by the vertical movement divided by the square root of that thing. Now the best case scenario is you input TW and get R as an output, but the worst case scenario is you get R, you input R and try to find TW because this now becomes harder to solve. Notice that in the finite element method, your input is usually the force and your output is a displacement. So good luck solving that. Now this is still possible to solve in the realm of mathematics. And you can notice that this is annoying. For the simplest of problems, imagine what happens if you have a more complicated problem with a lot of nonlinearities, or maybe two springs or three springs that each activate at different times. You can see where this is going. This is going to be absolutely horrible to deal with. But for now, since we are talking about small displacement, it's still in the realm of possible. Anyway, let's just recap very quickly. Uh, response behavior one. Cable doesn't touch the spring, meaning you have those forces only, and you can just sum forces y to get this. This is a relationship. It's a linear relationship between the displacement and r. And of course, you have the values 2h and l, and you can just calculate them. This is actually an easy equation to calculate. And uh, I mean, h is, I think, 100 newton, l is 100 centimeter. And you can basically say it's just uh, a 2 to 1 equation. You can just put the numbers here. Keep in, mind, keep in mind the units and that's it. For the second behavior, response behavior number two, I think my teaching assistant messed up. The cable does touch the spring. So the spring now is activated and I have a reactionary force at the spring. There is a force of the spring, Fs. Now, if you sum up forces now, something has changed. There is still the two forces. Uh, there is still the two horizontal forces with sine theta and sine theta is... So this part is still the same. 
but suddenly there is a spring activating and you can see that the spring activation is basically the force of the spring equals the spring constant multiplied by the compression of the spring x and the compression of the spring x is any extra deflection from the gap let's think about this why do i have a negative here let's just try to think about it if the movement down is one centimeter exactly then the spring has just been touched but it doesn't produce any forces because you are not compressing the spring with the deflection at time t equals the gap exactly so one then you don't have a spring action this means that this minus this is going to be zero which leads to the spring being zero which is absolutely okay because if you just touch the spring the spring will not activate now if you compress the spring one centimeter you would have to push two centimeters down to compress the spring one centimeter because if you push two centimeters down then one centimeter is expended on the gap and the second centimeter is the only centimeter that counts in the compression of the spring and that's why we have tw or w at time t minus w gap that's the reason why we have a negative here i hope this makes sense that's another equation um, for you you have all the values so all that remains is just to plot now i had a i had a request to do it in matlab in one of my comments I don't think this deserves it, but I think I would do MATLAB uh, scripts later for real nonlinear analysis. This is something easy, but it still serves the purpose of understanding how nonlinear finite element methods work. And that's another type of nonlinearity where suddenly a spring gets activated when the gap is closed and becomes deactivated when the gap is filled. You can see that there is a distinct change in uh, behavior. In the beginning, it was less stiff, so you can see for one centimeter movement, you needed two newtons. But suddenly, if you want to increase another centimeter, you would need four newtons. The system got stiffer, and the reason why the system got stiffer is because the spring got activated. And you can see the clear boundary, the, the clear differentiation between less stiff and more stiff at one centimeter. Because everything before one centimeter was not activating the spring, and everything after the one centimeter was activating the spring. So yeah, that's basically everything I wanted to talk about today. I know this video might be shorter than usual, but I don't want to start my uh, finite element application of the nonlinear analysis right now because it would be an overkill to include in one video. So in the next video, we're going to start dealing with some cryptic equations, but I will try my best to kind of uh, basically decompose those equations into smaller pieces that you can understand. So with that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video. And before I finish, I want to give a nonlinear boundary condition sized shout out to my dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as their support to the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos hopefully on time and with a certain quality I try to achieve and for that I am forever thankful. In the end, I hope that you enjoyed the video and you found it beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting and so on especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye bye.